Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream today that I think you're really going to enjoy. Uh, coming in after the summit in Iowa over the weekend, I know a number of you tuned into that. Thank you very much, by the way. Got a lot of very nice comments. It was very interesting. My first time kind of doing live commentary at an event like that. So that was very interesting. It was very, very cool experience for sure. Uh, like I said, very, very nice that so many people were supportive. Really appreciate that. And of course, uh, got in the flight really late uh, the night before. I don't know if you guys have done any air travel here recently, but uh, it is terrible. Um, everything is delayed like all the time. So I had like eight or nine hours of delays on the way there. So I had very little sleep. I was very tired uh, at the start of the event. You could probably tell. Uh, but uh, it, it was fun overall. Definitely a, a very cool experience. And again, I really appreciate so many of you and your kind words. Uh, th that was very cool to be a part of. And uh, very, very interesting things that came out of that. Tucker ran a very different event. Uh, he, he was asking people in you know big questions in a one-on-one -on -one format that I thought was very different and much more informative than your average debate. You know, Normally, these people get on stage. We have maybe 30 second sound bites as everybody tries to interrupt each other and fight for time. And it's just not very useful. It doesn't really do anything for anybody. Uh, but this was very different. It was a one on one with Tucker, who obviously is somebody who's very on top of kind of where the party's at, where the issues are at, where the base is at. Uh, he had a lot of tough questions for people. <laughs> a couple of campaigns exploded right there on stage in real time. Uh, and so that was very different uh, and I think much more informative. I think a lot of people in the base appreciated uh, that candidates were not getting a free pass and that they were actually having time to make, but at the same time, having time to make their points. You know, it wasn't a big gotcha session, uh, but it also uh, wasn't just a, a big uh, hug fest. We we had a, a nice mix there. And of course, the Blaze did a great job. Uh, everybody over there produced, they, they threw that thing together. Uh, it was kind of outside the normal uh auspices of kind of the mainstream Fox News managed by something like CNN or somebody uh, type of debate. And so it was very nice to finally see, uh, you know, a, a different format. Uh, I think I think it went pretty well. But yeah, you, you had a few people like Mike Pence and Asa Hutchison. They really just kind of kind of blew up there on stage. So that was very different. All right, guys. So today we're going to go ahead and get into the work of Nick Land. We're returning to Nick Land and his political theory. Remember, Land is himself a uh, a former Marxist who ended up uh, running into Minchus Moldbug or Curtis Yarvin, as he's now known, uh, and took a very interesting path into kind of right wing political theory. Uh, so we're going to see some of his thoughts will still be lingering over from kind of that disposition when we look at the role of money today. Uh, but I like to go over Nick Land's work because it's some very formative stuff. It's stuff that helped to build up some of my understanding of politics. And it, it's a great compliment to Curtis Yarvin's work, which I think more of you are probably familiar with. But it's also can be notoriously difficult to get through. Uh, again, we're working from a Xenosystems blog today and uh, the, the fragments of that that kind of defunct blog. And these are a little easier to to tackle when we get into them. Uh, but I think it's very useful to break these down bit by bit. Uh, a lot of you guys come here for kind of the more technical side of politics. Uh, you know, if, if you want people yelling about the latest outrage, uh, you know, I do some of that, too. But there's a lot of that. So I try to make sure to give people some some quality here, uh, you know, not not just all filler, uh, you know, try, try to get some some ideas on on the program. So that's one of the reasons I'm doing this series to kind of flesh out these more complicated theoretical points so we can better understand the issues that come up in the news when, when they come around. So we're going to go ahead and turn our attention to Nick Land's essay here, On Power. Uh, many different uh, thinkers have had an essay called On Power or entire book. Uh, Bertrand de Juvenal comes to mind as, as one of the best, uh, but he is speaking here directly about ideas that concern state power. A lot of people, there, there's a lot of debate. I'm sure you've probably seen, uh, and I even made a video kind of con you know, contrasting these ideas of power, uh, something like Starship Troopers, uh, which, which famously said, you know, uh, force is violence, uh, and this is where all authority derives from. 
Uh, and then you have places like uh, like Game of Thrones, which kind of said, okay, but what is power? Is it, is it the king? Is it the swordsman? Is it the banker? Who really wields power? You know, when we talk about power, what does that mean? And so Nick Land has some ideas on what power actually is and what it looks like in the real world. And so we're going to kind of dive into his thoughts on what power is. I agree with a good amount of this, but not all of it. So we'll get into the parts that I disagree with here a little bit. Uh, so here we go. He says, uh, power, is an, uh, power is an idea. It is exactly what is thought what it is thought to be. So from the very beginning, he's saying power is an idea. There's a lot of questions about, you know, how does power manifest itself? How does it get applied? But it is primarily an idea. And he'll he'll get into this, how power and the idea of power coincide, uh, which will become a little more important here in a moment. Uh, even among pre-civilized social animals, where the temptation to confuse power with force is strongest, the need to, uh, to demonstrate force is only sporadic. And wherever force is not continuously demonstrated, power has arisen. All right, so we're already seeing our delineation here between the idea of force and power. So if you said directly, force and power are the same thing, Nick Land is going to say no. And I think if we really look at most situations, we kind of inherently understand this. We know that force and power are linked. Actually, I think the major mistake that many people in our modern world make is to think that force and power are not linked, uh, especially, again, in the United States, where we talk about the power of the government. It's constrained by the Constitution, you know, checks and balances. It's the people that really have power. Well, that's not true. Um, and a lot of people make the mistake of saying of thinking that power and force are disconnected things. Power is is whatever something says on in a constitution, right? It's whatever's written down on paper, it's whatever the law is. We're a nation of laws, rule of law. That's where power really is. Um, and, and that that's not exactly it either. Power and force are connected, but here land is just trying to make it very clear to us that force and power, while they are, they have a relationship, they are dependent on each other, they are separate things. And in fact, he says here, wherever force is not continuously demonstrated, power has arisen. So power in Nick Land's construction is what starts to exist when we, when something that wants to own or dominate or control something in regulation on, or on a regular basis no longer has to continually apply force. So that's that's going to be the beginning of the idea of power. What is uh, uh, That is how dominance distinguishes itself from predation. So we have dominance and predation. Predation would just be the, the classic, again, he starts here with the animal kingdom. Obviously, the, uh, you know, the lion has he wants a zebra he chases after a gazelle or whatever uh takes one down that's predation there's there's no dominance there right and he'll go on to explain this in a second there, there's no need for dominance between the lion and its prey it's simply something to eat on occasion no doubt a predator dominates its prey convincing a uh, uh convincing a struggling herbivore that resistance is futile and its passage into nourishment is already virtually over. Even in these cases, however, a predator does not seek to install an, in, an enduring domination. It matters not at all that, th that its command of irresistible force be recognized beyond the moment of destruction. There is no social relationship to establish. So this is the really key part here. What's the difference between dominance and predation? It's that social relationship, right? The, the lion's going to kill its prey. It, once it's killed its prey, it doesn't really care anymore, right? There, this is not going to be a recurring interaction between the lion and its prey. This is a one and done thing. So predation is simply the act of taking out something, you know, having power over it and then using it up, consuming it, right? However, domination is different. Domination is a continuous social relationship. You expect to go back to this relationship over time. So a state or something else that is exerting power 
might have to kill someone. It might have to to get rid of some uh, some person. But in general, it's looking to dominate, not just uh, be a predator. It's looking to have a continuous relationship, which means in general, it needs to avoid killing that which it has power over. So, you know, the, 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 the animal that's being completely destroyed is, is going to be lunch, might eventually give up. It might be dominated in a moment where it realizes there's no longer a reason to struggle. However, uh, w- when you have this more dominant relationship, then that's going to be one that's happening over and over again. You need to establish it. I see someone saying like a farmer and livestock and chat there. And yeah, that's a good example with the animal kingdom, right? Though often you don't even necessarily have to, to fully dominate. It depends on how domesticated the animal is, right? If it's a very domesticated animal, then minimal domination will be required. If it's a less domesticated animal, then more will be required. But that is a good example that you're giving there of kind of that back and forth, right? If the, if the, uh farmer's going to come back to that animal and milk it or you know uh, shear the sheep or whatever if they're going to continuously glean some kind of advantage they can't just go out and just completely uh destroy the the thing that they want to continuously gain advantage from you don't want to kill the golden goose right the the one that lays the golden egg you want it to continue to lay eggs and so there's this there's this relationship and this is also true of governments and people now people aren't going to like that they're going to say well i'm not an animal i'm not livestock uh you know i'm i'm a free individual who operates inside my society uh but there is a relationship here that you need to understand don't don't just be offended by that initial uh kind of picture there because we need to understand this relationship that he's talking about of course at the beginning he's just talking about these really uh, uncomplicated relationships, basically, or even a lack of relationship between the predator and the prey. So obviously he's going to talk about more complicated relationships, more nuanced relationships uh, that tend to be between humans uh, as we move on here. All right. So our next uh, part here, even the most rudimentary society requires something more. The economy of force has to be institutionalized and power perfectly coincides with the idea of power is born. So again, power and the idea of power happen simultaneously. The idea of power must exist for power to exist because the economy of force has to be institutionalized. There has to be an understanding that this, again, you must have force. Understand this right away. All governments, I don't care how free you are, I don't care what kind of constitution, rule of law, whatever your founding myth is, that's all very nice. But the reason your government is in power is at some point it it settled the question of force. And if you don't think that's true, all you have to do is look at the history of the United States, right? So the United States, we start off with this really loose confederal government it's called the Articles of Confederation for kids who don't know. The uh, Constitution is not the first governing document in the United States. Uh, That's not what governed the United States for about the first 10 years of its existence. It was the Articles of Confederation that first governed the United States. And what happened? Well, the Articles of Confederation didn't put very many restrictions on the states. It let the states more or less do what they want, which was kind of the whole point, right? The states were supposed to have rights and freedoms. They were supposed to have the majority of the power. The, they wanted a weak federal government because they just got rid of, rid, of, rid of a king and yada yada. And so the Articles of Confederation were a very loose governing document. They didn't really have a standing army. They didn't really have the ability to wield a lot of force against the people. Well, at some point, uh, the, gov- the government of Massachusetts figured out that it couldn't really pay off its portion of the war debt from the Revolutionary War. And so they decided to tax everybody. Uh, if this sounds familiar, that's because that's exactly what happened to start the revolution in the first place. The the government, you know, the the uh, British government, the the crown decided to tax Americans after the uh, French and Indian War to pay back uh, all the debts they had acquired, and Americans didn't like that, so they fought a revolution over it. Well, then the American government, or at least the state governments, did the same thing, and they taxed farmers in Massachusetts until basically none of them could pay for it. So what did you get? You got Shays' Rebellion, which was a rebellion of these farmers who couldn't pay their taxes. 
uh, they said, we, we already went to war over this. We're not going to lose our farms. They started by protesting the courthouses where uh, their, their homes were being foreclosed on, where their farms were being foreclosed on. But eventually an actual rebellion started to form. And so guess what the government did? They didn't say, oh, well, uh, I mean, I guess that's fine because you're free people. No, uh, they did their best to get to actually the governor of Massachusetts ended up assembling a private army because he couldn't get uh, there was really no United States army. And the uh, the state itself would not raise money for the army. But I don't want to give you guys the whole history lesson. The point is that they put down this rebellion because for all the Declaration of Independence and, oh, whenever, you know, men feel like a government is is oppressing them, they can break away and and start their own government. It's their duty to have the right of rebellion. Yeah, all that stuff just vanished, right? Just just a, less, just a decade later, it was all gone. Uh, and they're like, no, we're definitely not going to let you guys rebel. And so they, they put down the rebellion. And then they wrote the Constitution to make sure that they could centralize more government power and it would be harder to rebel. And you could tell it was harder to rebel because then there was the Whiskey Rebellion, and George Washington, as the first president of the United States, actually went out and quelled the Whiskey Rebellion. So it turns out, actually, you didn't have the right to rebel. And you weren't just a free citizen of the United States who could decide to break away at any moment. And of course, if we had any question about that, that was settled uh, with the Civil War. And so the idea that you know the, the government does not need to uh, exert force is a fallacy. Uh, obviously, all governments start by securing a monopoly of violence inside their borders. Any government that does not have a monopoly of violence, more or less, inside its borders, will be a failed state. That's pretty much the definition of a failed state, is the failure to secure a monopoly of violence inside your own border. So again, violence or force is a critical part of any state's operation. After that question is settled, after the question of force inside the state is settled, then you can work towards building civilization. Once you have uh, settled the question of violence, then you start getting the emergence of, of order, and then you start getting the emergence of law, and then you might be lucky enough to get the emergence of liberty. If you're, if you're very lucky and you're in a very specific place in time, but that is the order of operations. This is something that like libertarians get wrong all the time. They tend to believe that uh, you first you write the law, first you get the contract law in place, and then order arises from it. That's why they have like the you know, non-aggression principle. Oh, we'll get rid of violence, right? But that's not how it works. That, that's not how it works at all. Violence, the question of violence must be answered by the state first. And once it is answered, then the state might be bound to some extent by laws. I did a, a stream on binding sovereignty, also reading from Nick Land earlier. So if you want to go back and learn more about that idea, can we bind sovereignty? Can constitutions contain state sovereignty? Um, I'm not going to rehash all of that because I already did a full stream on it. But if you want to go back and, and check into that question, you can. Our point here is that violence is always present at the beginning of a state. It must be used to secure a state. If you allow other actors to regularly exercise violence inside your state you are a failed state that's why narco states uh, are generally their their governments are shams uh, they're they're there to interface as the legitimate arm usually of a narcotics cartel with other uh with other uh entities but they do not actually own the monopoly on violence in the state and that's a serious problem now there's always degrees of this obviously like we know certain parts of chicago or or other dangerous cities in the United States, uh, the government doesn't have a monopoly on violence. And in those situations, by the way, guess what the guess what the gangs start doing? They start acting like governments, right? They provide security for the areas they control. Uh, they they hand out like loans to people. Like they start filling different things that a government basically does. They do it much more violently with, with less order. It's not it's not preferable in most cases. But gangs are just small scale governments. Uh, if they control the monopoly on violence in an area, they are kind of the government, a state inside a state. Uh, and so that's kind of relationship between force and power. Power uh, uh, must secure force in the use of force inside the nation, inside the state to uh, maintain its position. But the continued use of it, as we'll see here in a moment, is a sign of 
weakness. So like I said, uh, you know, even the most rudimentary society must have this uh, institutionalization of force. When power is tested, driven to uh, or driven to resort to force or regress to it, the ideas, uh, idea has already slipped. Its weakness is exposed. I'll read that again because it was a little disjointed from what I was saying before. So going back into Nick Land's uh, 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 essay here, when power is tested, driven driven to resort to force or regress to it, the idea has already slipped. Its weakness is exposed. So Land is saying here, if a regime has to regularly resort to violence, it has lost something. It has lost power. Power is the idea. Force is something that may realize part of the idea, but its continued uh, use is a weakness and not a strength. Now, I have a little bit of disagreement with him here. I think that this is always true of Fox-style governments, right? Fox-style governments do not want to use force. Uh, tricky governments uh, in the Vilfredo Pareto idea, the, the type one residue, uh, they do not want to use force. These are clever people. They rule through manipulation, propaganda, complex systems. They do not like force. And so the less they have to use force, the better. We are ruled by foxes. They do not like using force. And the more they have to use force, the more you can tell they're weak because they're, they're not good at it. It's not, it's not good for them. Now, I think that's not exactly true with lion style leaders, leaders that are from the martial caste who are clearly generals, field marshals, excuse me, experienced warriors. They are more likely to be okay with the display of force. However, the key thing about it is it is very limited and effective. They might be willing to use force more often than say a Fox style government. However, when they use it, it is swift, it's brutal, it's effective, it's limited to its area, and then they move on. And once they use it, they demonstrate that they don't need to use it very often because they are so competent at it that no one would really want to go up against them. So for instance, if you, if you wanna get the, uh, the difference between these two regimes, uh, if you protest in Canada, what do they do? They they cancel your bank account. Now, there, there's, uh, as my good uh, friend uh, Black Horse has pointed out on a regular basis, they also did eventually use force on those protesters. So I'm not trying to turn this into just a binary, but I just want to give you a general idea, um, you know, kind of the difference. So in a Fox style government, if they want to put down protesters, what do they do? They use surveillance technology. Uh, they shut down their bank accounts. They, you know, they tr they track them with uh, with electronic stuff. You know, they, they make it difficult for them to get jobs. They operate in soft power. These things are still highly effective. They still silence dissent. They are still just as tyrannical or totalitarian uh, when properly implemented as force, but it's a very different approach. As we're in a more martial style system, in a more lion style system, they would just immediately remove the threat. Okay, boom, you're gone, right? Like you disappear. Uh, or, you know, you get cracked down on, you're, you're entirely removed from the situation, we don't have to worry about you anymore. Uh, again, more swift, more brutal, very effective, uh, but messy. So there, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a kind of a visceral reaction people have to the use of force that can possibly delegitimize or destabilize a government, uh, depending on how they use it. However, if they're swift and brutal and effective, very few people are going to regularly challenge their power. And so what he's saying here is, again, whether you're in a soft Fox style government, which is trying to use primarily manipulation and trickery, or if you're in a more forceful lion style government, which is very good at force and can use it very effectively and very swiftly and brutally, either way, if these regimes are strong, they have to use force very rarely because either they're so good at manipulation, they don't need to use force, or they're so good at force nobody's going to mess with you. And so the, the key to understand is how often do they use it? If they're regularly, brutally using force, even if, whether they're good at it or bad at it, that means that they don't have power the same way because power is the idea. When power is in place, you don't need to resort to force on a regular basis because the power 
is what's holding everybody in place, whether it's the threat of force or the threat of propaganda, uh, you know, manipulation, financial control, whatever, whatever that tool of, of the state is. If they don't have to use it very often, if they don't have to use force very often, then they're in a good place. If they do have to use it very often, then you know they're weaker, which is why I think we can probably see on a regular basis that many Western regimes are growing weaker because they used to be able to. And remember, this is internally, guys, not externally. We're not talking here about using force against other enemies, though that is also part of power, right? If you can project power through the strength of your military, you don't have to use the military as often. But what I'm talking about here is internally. We're talking about internal security forces, internal police forces. We can see that many Western nations are weakening because they used to be able to use manipulation, to use finance, finances, to use propaganda to better control their uh, their citizens. And some of them are now having to resort to force more often. All right. So let's go ahead and move on inside our essay here. Mere dominance has to regularly reassert itself, rebuilding itself out of force. Under civilized conditions, in contrast, power is exempted from the test of force and thus realizes itself consummately. It becomes magic and religion, perfectly identified with its apprehension as a radiant assumption. All right, so all he's saying here is, if you're just going with raw dominance, if your position is unstable, then you have to regularly assert force all the time to show people that you're in charge and they're not. People are willing and able to test your power. And so the only way for you to maintain that dominance is the regular use of force. This is the sign of a relatively weak regime because they constantly have to be tested. People are willing to test them all the time. And so they have to constantly show that they are strong. Now, again, remember, uh, if you have a situation like North Korea, and I, I don't want to pretend to be an expert on North Korea. There are people who know far more. So I'm not going to play at some kind of uh, foreign uh, you know, policy uh, you know, kind of uh, expert here. But if you have a regime like that, that is kind of known more for its force, the people might be terrified of the force that the regime would uh, expend on them if they cross the line. And so they don't cross the line. So you could have a regime that is based on force, raw power, that is not tested, that is strong because the uh, the people will not test it. The people are, are so, are so uh, aware of the ability of the regime, of its power and its ability to destroy them, that they do not test it. Now, again, I don't know if that's really where North Korea is at. My point is not to, to like, pick apart their actual structure. My point is to just say that those kind of regimes exist. But of course, obviously, when it comes to soft power, the most effective force is propaganda. If people believe that the system is legitimate and that the things that the system does is in their interest, and by the way, those things could just be true. Like the system could just be working. There, there are such things as good countries. There are such things as good uh, good governments. And so there could be that the government's interest really is aligned with yours and you really are flourishing. And so you're happy to go along with everything. But there's also a situation in which the government doesn't feel like that, or, you know, they, they have their own agenda, but they are so good at using propaganda that they can convince you that you are uh, being taken care of, that you are free, that you are doing what you need to do. And therefore they don't need to re-exert their force on a regular basis. Their dominance is already secured. And then that dominance turns into power. And like, this is what he says here, right? It becomes magic and religion, right? These things become built in. Nobody has to talk about them. Nobody needs to analyze them. Nobody needs demonstrations of their power because they exist in a metaphysical sense. They, 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 uh, they manifest themselves without actually having to be demonstrated through actual uh, exertion of force. And that's when you know that you really have power in a situation. Power is thus profoundly paradoxical. Its truth is inextricably, uh, inextricable from a derealization so that when it's practically interrogate, interrogated by forces determined to excavate its reality, it tends to nothing. All right, so what does that mean? It means you can't separate power 
from the fact that it doesn't actually have to be realized. The whole power that has to be realized, power that needs to be like actually manifested and used, exerted in the real world in a concrete way is already failing power. Like he said previously, the need to exert that force, the need to apply pressure uh, shows that you are already losing some of that magic. So if you are realizing your power, you're actually losing it in many ways. And we can see this, by the way, I've talked a lot about force here, but we could also see this in a propagandist sense, right? So if the regime needs to tell you a man is a woman, that's that's a big ask, right? Like that's a that's a that's a kind of a raw power move, right? Because it's so clear that that's not true. That that throughout all of human history, it hasn't been true. That your your grandparents, grandparents, grandparents knew that the simplest peasant in the middle of nowhere knew this, right? So when a regime tries to tell you that you have to believe that, that's quite the flex, right? So if the regime has total power. If it really has that incredible degree of power, it can just tell you that and you'll just say yes, right? You'll just say yes because that's the level of power exerted by the system, by the state. However, if you, if a lot of people say no, as many people are now, and they're pushing back against that, that means either power has made too big of an ask that it didn't have the actual force to, or the actual power to, to make real, or it has weakened and it needs to start applying some of its force. Now, again, it may not do that directly with like stormtroopers, but it's going to need to start pushing soft power in a way that breaks its illusion of control, right? If I see everyone desperately censoring and desperately trying to cancel and everyone desperately trying to push people out of university or whatever who, who say this out of the medical field, then I know something's wrong. I know that I can see the machine scrambling to control. And if I can if I can perceive the machine, if I can see the cathedral as it's often called, the the deep state, the mind control device, if I can see the mind control device then it's broken. Right? If if I can if I can see the reality manipulation tool and perceive it, then it's not doing its job. And so that's what he's saying here is that the that the power should have perfect control. Like perfect power would have perfect control. Obviously, we never really achieve perfect power. That's very rare. Um, you know, the state rarely has that level of control. It's almost always a, a lesser version of this. But if there was perfect power, the state would simply say something and it would be followed. Boom, right? And when I say the regime here, the state, remember, we're not just talking about the formal arms of government. We're also talking about you know media. We're talking about banks. We're talking about... Uh, all these you know d different corporations we're talking about these bureaucracies we're talking about all these different elements that are used to kind of keep power simultaneously uh, so we want to discard the notion that the state or the the regime is simply only the the arms of government that are described in the constitution or wherever formally on paper uh, it is much beyond that but if it has to exert that level of control if it doesn't simply make those orders and they are followed, then that means there's something wrong. It's it's made too big of an ask. It didn't have the power to do what it wanted to. And then it's losing that, right? So back to the essay here. Even the force that power calls upon when pressed to demonstrate or realize itself has to be spellbound to its ideal. Will the generals obey? obey? Will the soldiers shoot? It is power and not force that decides, right? So this was the question, again, if you've ever seen uh, Game of Thrones, right? Who has the power? The, 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 the sword, the swordsman, the king, the merchant, right? Who's in control? The answer is uh, it depends, right? It, it depends. Directly, the swordsman has the force. But the king can command a thousand swordsmen, and so the force of one swordsman doesn't really matter. There's something else that is at play, right? There's something more, uh, more complex. When the force is called upon, will they respond? When that inevitable check on power comes, when the question comes, will the people who actually hold guns and actually run tanks and actually fire missiles say yes to an order? That's when power is checked. 
And in case you want to understand who holds power in the United States, when Donald Trump told the military to get out of um, Afghanistan, they said no, right? The generals have said this, uh, that, you know, they, they have said this openly. When they were told to draw down engagement, they just ignored the president and they did it on a regular basis. That means that he was not wielding power. It means power existed somewhere outside of the president's constitutional authority, right? And so even though an individual soldier might have a weapon or, uh, you know, an individual soldier might have a, a cruise missile, might have a, an, an airplane, and uh, you know, pilot might have an airplane, uh, some guy might be manning a Minuteman, uh, you know, uh, silo somewhere, they are still operating on orders, which means that while they have direct control of the force, they do not have the power. And if a entity cannot call upon that force, if an entity calling itself the state cannot call upon that force, then no power exists. So back to the essay here. No surprise, therefore, that power can evaporate like the snow slopes of a volcano, as if instantaneously, when an eruption of force is scarcely more than a rumble. Power is the eruption, not the happening. Or sorry, uh, power is the eruption, not happening. That's really important. Power is the eruption, not happening. Far more than the eruption being contained. So what's he saying here? He's saying that because power is in many ways, this is this idea that power and the idea of power are the same thing. The minute that force no longer listens to power, power can evaporate poof, in a minute. That's why, you know, things like military coups happen suddenly. It's an eruption, right? And power is the, is the eruption not happening. What should happen directly is that those with force should use it, uh, that those with force should use it to immediately take what they want, right? Like in a, in a, in a direct kind of state of nature, scenario those with power would just uh or sorry those with force those with the weapon those with a w with whatever a gun would just go ahead and immediately uh take whatever they wanted right that that that's what force would do but power restrains that it controls that and in fact it says not only does it not contain it it never even occurs to those that wield the force that the force is actually theirs to control Right. And this is why military chain of commands are so important. Right. This is why the United States, especially, uh, is constantly straining the civilian control of the military because they never want the military to feel like they're the ones who actually own the force. Right. They don't want them to feel like they're the ones that are actually in charge of the force. The force is something that you're holding for power. And and the power never really even has to constrain the force because the force would never think of acting without power say so, right? That's what makes it power is that its simple existence means that force cannot even imagine a scenario in which it would exert itself without the command of power. And if that's gone, if that vanishes, if that if that leaves then that force suddenly becomes its own and power just poof, gone, right? And all of a sudden it's all about uh, force in again instead of power. Now, if you're wondering why it's become really important for the Biden administration to purge those ranks, right? <laughs> they, and they said it op openly uh, today on Twitter, uh, there was a, there's a U.S. Air Force adjacent organization I think they're they're like a civilian arm of it, but the uh, you know they're like connected in some way. Uh, but they're like we're basically getting orders from top down, like get rid of white guys, you know, don't 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 have uh, white dudes uh, in like positions of authority. We don't we don't need any more white pilots, right? We need to get rid of those guys. You'll see the same thing when they had the the vaccine purges uh, in the uh, military, right? They wanted specifically they tried to get rid of anybody who wouldn't take the vaccine, but they were also wanting to get rid of after the events of January 6th and everything. They wanted to get rid of anybody who was a MAGA supporter. If you made too many Trump posts on your social media, if you had an NRA so, uh, you know, uh, membership, uh, you could be flagged as some kind of danger. They wanted to get anybody who wouldn't immediately conform to power out of the military because they're 
planning to make some moves and they uh they want to make sure that the military doesn't think that it's independent of power they want it to be entirely dependent on power and entirely spellbound by power that's why they want to move more client classes in there they want less fit people in there they want people they want to move a, a large amount of immigrants in there they don't want anyone who has a connection to anything except the regime they don't want somebody who has some kind of connection to the people to to any kind of other loyalty that wouldn't be directly under kind of the regime. And they're doing this for a very good reason that this is actually just smart power politics, right? You want your security force entirely dedicated to you as the ruler. You don't want them dedicated to the, to you as the people, maybe as the people who don't want to be completely totalitarian, you know, be controlled by a totalitarian government. You want a, a, a army or a force that is loyal to you and not to a government. Uh, but that's the exact opposite of what power wants. They want force to never think of using itself, exerting itself in any cause except in uh, the orders of the regime. All right, let's move on here. So now we're going to move to the economic side of this. Less, less, I promised you fiat currency. So you might have noticed that the first one here, you know, it's power, force. And then you're like, the third one is fiat currency. Why is this included? So uh, all, all the libertarian Bitcoin guys can can uh, geek out here. All right, here we go. So to conceive economic power as wealth is to misconstrue it as rationalized force and thus to miss the idea. True economic power is thoroughly derealized yet authoritative, uh, uh, derealized yet authoritative standard and store of value as instantiated exclusively in fiat currency. I'll read that again because I kind of broke up there for a second. So uh, true economic power is a, is a thoroughly derealized yet authoritative standard and store of value as instantiated exclusively in fiat currency. So what is he saying there? He's saying that economic power is not just having stuff. It's not just totally having you know all the all the uh, gold or totally having all of the oil or all the useful uh, widgets or whatever it's not just having the material real economic power is uh is not realized right when you're when you're talking about all of those things you're talking about realized uh wealth right oh, here you know where's your wealth oh i can produce it right but the whole reason he went through this explanation of power was actually explained to you what economic power is, right? So just like you think you might think of military power as the ability to like produce soldiers or government power as the ability to produce FBI agents who have guns and can fight you. He's saying that's not real power, right? Power that has to be manifested, that has to be shown. If they have to use the security forces against your own people, you don't really have power. Your power is failing. He's saying this is also true in economics. He says real economic power is not having to manifest your wealth. Yes, wealth can exist. You can have all the oil, you can have all the gold, you can have all the planes and trains and automobiles and whatever, right? But the need to manifest that, manifest that is not wealth, is not power. Real economic power is not realized. It simply exists through promises like fiat currency. If your fiat currency is respected, you have economic power. If people will take pieces of paper with no value and no backing to them that cannot be exchanged directly for some kind of specie currency, right? And they will treat that as a store of real value. Now you have economic power because you don't even have to manifest it. Someone can show up to your gold window with a dollar bill and you can just laugh in their face. You don't need to manifest the that that uh, economic wealth for them you don't need to show that to them because you have fiat currency power you have real power right back to land's essay here monetary signs that are not backed by anything beyond the credit or credibility of the state are tokens of pure supremely idealized power in its economic form they symbolize the effective because untested suppression of anarchy very interesting there right they live through the uh, the idea and die with it so he's saying a untested uh, an unchallenged fiat currency is the purest manifestation of power 
it is it is the suppression of anarchy. I can control all uh, economic and and even physical challenges to my power because people respect meaningless pieces of paper that I hand out. That is true power. And the idea, as it with power, lives and dies by this. So if you have built your power on a fiat currency, then the destruction of uh, that fiat, fiat currency is the destruction of your power. If you built an economic empire on the idea that your fiat currency is the standard, and you and it has not been tested because you don't have to manifest that wealth, and then you have this amazing power. But the minute it's tested, it can evaporate again, just like that, just like that military power, right? The re the reason the the minute force refuses to respond to power, like the snows on the slope of a volcano, power can evaporate. And this is also true when it comes to fiat currency. Back to Land's essay again. Those who recognize the completion of power in an idea, celebrants and antagonists alike, have no reason to object to its belated baptism as the cathedral. Our contemporary political appropriation of numinous authority, served, uh, uh, served by an academic, journalistic, judicial, and administrative clerisy, prominently including the priest of fiat adoration and financial uh, central planning. All right, so that's a lot of fancy words. What does that mean? He's saying, if you recognize that complete power as an idea, whether you celebrate it, whether you're, you're a fan of that idea, or you're against it, if you understand that as existing, then you can't really object to this cathedral. Again, that's land and, and Yarvin's word for what many people would call the deep state or the regime or the system. Uh, and I know a lot of people don't like the phrase cathedral. Fine, call it whatever you want. Understand the idea, right? Grasp the grasp the idea behind it. This, uh, this um, you know, decentralized consensus manufacturing apparatus that rules the Western world. And he, and he names all of the ways that it's assembled. So, so how is this government system assembled? He calls it numinous. That's, he's talking about a religious authority. So he's, he's tying it to a religion, right? And it's served by academics, journalists, uh, the judicial process, and the administrative clerisy. You'll notice he calls basically administrative bureaucrats the clerisy there. He's calling them priests, right? And that's exactly what they are, right? They are those that serve power in a religious fashion. And he says it prominently includes the priesthood of fiat adoration and financial central planning. So in order for this kind of state to exist, central planning must exist. Those who, who talk about the free market in the West or in America are delusional. There is no free market in America. There is no free market. Uh, sorry, guys. Like I, I know some of my audience, they're new here. I'm not trying to insult anybody. Uh, I know a lot of people came in from from like Rush Limbaugh and stuff, and they're like, they Rush told me about the free market, man. Reagan, he promised me the free market. Not a thing, okay? Uh, you, it, your economy is centrally planned. It has to be. You can't maintain a fiat currency. You can't have a reserve, a federal reserve bank without central planning, okay? So this, so this is this is not a thing. He says there is no macroeconomics that is not cathedral liturgy so basically you cannot control the wider economy if you're manipulating the wider economy through financial policy you are buying into the cathedral you're buying into this operational government right um no confidence or animal spirits independent of its devotions no economic cataclysm that is not simultaneously a crisis of faith a single idea is at stake so he's saying this is all one thing, right? He's saying it's all one thing. You cannot have this uh, idea of a Federal Reserve Bank and macroeconomics and uh, global financial manipulation, fiat currencies. You cannot have them without it also being uh, tied to the entire existence of power inside of this regime. They are all one thing. They all exist simultaneously. To destroy one of them is to destroy them all. To support one of them is to support them all. They are the same thing. They exist in the, at, at the same time. They reinforce each other. They they uh, 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 yeah they they support each other. In macroeconomic and macroeconomics, as in politics, more generally, only one systematically in, uh, inhibited question remains: Do we believe? Well, 
do we? All right. So obviously leaves us with a cliffhanger. Cliffhanger there. This is this is more of a uh, explanatory essay than it is a essay of solutions, which is so often the case. Right? Way easier to kind of pick these things apart and explain how they work, and explain how the ideas are linked than it is to solve this problem. But in many ways, I think he is telling you how this problem gets solved. Everyone has to stop believing in the system, right? He's saying the whole system works together. Um, it, it's coexistent uh, and it's coterminous. So if, if, the, if, if this system falls apart, everything falls apart. Uh, if the system is any parts of the system are supported, the system continues in some form. And so um, he's not directly, you know, spelling out everything that would be involved in this. But this is why I think Nick Land is a big proponent of Bitcoin. He's, he's gone on and on about how important uh, Bitcoin is because Bitcoin does exactly this. It challenges the uh, authority of the state because the state, the authority of the state is backed in this economic system. It is backed in its ability to control currency. If the state can no longer manipulate currency, then it no longer has a string hold on sovereignty. And as we've learned when it comes to the uh, you know, force part of that, any state that long, no longer has complete sovereignty that hasn't settled that question uh, is a failed state. If the United States has a bunch of people not using its currency inside of its currency, it's a failed state. And this is just as if it had a lot of people, a lot of gangs who controlled the entire country, uh, it's a failed country, right? And a crypto state and a narco state would have a similar failing, right? All right, so uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap that up. We've got a few questions from the people here, guys. So we'll go ahead and uh, pivot over here to the super chat. Um, but like I said, you know, guys, if I've uh, done a number of these episodes now. If you want to know more about Nick Land's thought, if you want to connect some of these ideas, of course, uh, you know, you can watch my episodes. Uh, also, you can, of course, read Nick Land's work. Um, he has uh, The Dark Enlightenment which is now in, in, in print from Imperium Press, if I am correct about that. Xeno Systems Fragments is something you would have to download off the internet. Uh, you have to Google it. It's a PDF. The site doesn't exist anymore. Though I understand that I believe Passage Press is planning to uh, put more of that into actual print. That's the nice thing. You know, we use, all these things used to exist only digitally but they're, they're now going to exist physically in the real world uh, since these ideas have become more popular, these thinkers have become more popular, and so you can read them kind of uh, yourself. And then uh, there's also Feng Noumena, which is kind of Land's work uh, when he was more of a Marxist. Uh, those are still very interesting, but they are the least approachable parts of his work. Um, I've read Feng Noumena. Uh, there's a lot to learn there, uh, but just understand you are, you are climbing quite the mountain if you decide to, to, to kind of jump on board that one. Uh, but that said, uh, if, of course, if you want to get the easier versions of his work, uh, you can just listen to me because I've explained uh, a number of them. So let's jump over to our questions here real quick. Let's see. Michael Robinson for $20. It's pretty disheartening to see people I respect bickering on Twitter over who's going to be the presidential candidate. Do right-wingers have a duty to try to calm the infighting? Does this even matter? Great question, Michael. So I, I, I'm with you, right? I, I have uh, a general uh, preference. Uh, my preference is very simple. Uh, I am not a fan of democracy, as I have made very clear on a regular basis. Um, and I do not think that uh, democracy is a very good um, form of government. I think it produces a lot of exactly what we have now. It tends to bit the, pit the populace against each other and turn each other into enemies. Uh, it makes uh, the ruling class um, actually more secure and not less secure. They actually become less accountable as people uh, blame their, their neighbors instead of the government for what's going on. But it is the government we have. And I think that in this situation where we're probably not going to get a lot done at the national level, I think Donald Trump is the best choice because he is basically a rock getting thrown at the cathedral. He's a rock being thrown at the deep state in the media. Uh, he is the most kind of disruptive and destructive force. Again, I don't mean policy wise. Donald Trump, he did some good things. He governed some of the things he did when he was governing were good. But in general, he wasn't the most effective implementation of policy, right? Ron DeSantis, if you think the system works, if you think the system is 
uh, is salvageable, if you think the institutions can be reformed, then Ron DeSantis is your man. You know, if you think the systems aren't uh, salvageable, if you think that they aren't, uh, you know, uh, aren't going to be turned around, then I think Donald Trump is your man. Either way, I respect either of those positions. I, I totally understand them. If you're backing like Mike Pence, I can't help you. You're, you're a joke. But uh, if, you, if you hold uh, either of those candidates as viable, I totally respect you. What I don't understand is people who are just trying to tear each other apart online over this stuff. I mean, some of these people I get, like they have a vested interest in this, right? Like their their livelihoods are made on whether Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis gets in. There's a whole MAGA crowd that'll never work in a Ron DeSantis house, uh, White House. And there's a whole kind of like establishment crowd that can never get a job in kind of the the Donald Trump White House probably. And so these people are like vested in this uh, for sure. So I guess I, I get why they are going at each other in that manner. I don't think it's helpful at all. No, I don't. I should be clear. I don't. I'm not saying it, it's not helpful because we all got to get behind one candidate and we got to protect the sanctity of blah blah blah. I, I, I don't think it really matters. So I don't think you should debase yourself and destroy like your reputation, your credibility, and your personal relationships over something that's not going to really matter at the end of the day. So in my, my ar argument is not one of like everybody needs to get together and sing kumbaya because this is the most election of your lifetime and we all got to get out there and vote for the guy who's going to save us. That's not my argument. My argument is just, it's probably not going to matter. And actually I think guys like DeSantis are way more useful controlling states and local politics and making the push for change there. than I think they are like going to the national level and just running themselves head first into the deep state. Like, if neither Ron DeSantis or Donald Trump is going to dismantle the deep state, I'd rather have Ron DeSantis, you know, doing good stuff in Florida and showing other governors how to get things done and have Donald Trump just, you know, plow into him like a bull in a China shop. Like he, it's what he does, right? That that's why he's loved. <clears throat> so that would be my position on it. I think that it, it's going to matter to some extent, like the election could ma matter. You, people still believe at least to some extent in the power of elections. And so, you know, I think like a Ron DeSantis or a Trump presidency would be better than a Joe Biden presidency. So it's not that it doesn't matter at all, but I don't think it matters as much as people think it does. I don't think it's the the, the most important election of our lives. I don't think it's the, the thing on which all, all civilization hinges. And I don't think debasing yourself and trying to destroy other people is really going to be worth your time. I don't think anything I say about that is going to change anything. In fact, I know it isn't because I've already said this ad nauseum like for a year straight and no one listened to me and they're not going to listen now. Um, but uh, that said, you know, it, there is still some, there's some value here, right? So for instance, I just spent the weekend in Iowa uh, commentating on a presidential forum. Was that completely useless? I don't think so. Because for instance, Guys like Vivek Ramaswamy, who I don't think should be president. You know, he's a promising guy, uh, but I don't think he's he's in a position to be president right now. But he did say things during that forum that I think advanced the conversation in useful directions. He talked very forcefully about militarizing the border. He talked very forcefully about the need to dismantle the FBI. Now, I don't think he's going to win, but I think his willingness to talk about those things and get big rounds of applause and move the Overton window and the conversation in that way really matters. I think those things do matter. And so even though like he's not going to win, his presence in the conversation changes the conversation. And so I do think there are battles to be won there. I think there are things that do matter there. But this like knockdown drag out, you know, battle that people want to have over DeSantis and Trump. I don't think it's useful, but again, I don't think anyone's gonna <laughs> gonna listen to me. I don't think anybody's gonna save their self respect or their standing. Um, and I, I guess to some extent, a lot of these things get forgotten, right? I mean, look at how many people who were never Trump uh, were then able to like jump back on the bandwagon after that. A lot, you know, some of them were completely uh, tossed off, but a lot of them showed back up. Many of them ended up even inside the Trump administration, right? So. Uh, these things can be quickly forgotten kind of once everything is done. And so I do think it's important to, to remember that as well. Uh, people who you think might be kind of scuttling their entire chance uh, maybe aren't doing that, uh, depending on kind of how they're managing that. 
that said, guys, let's go ahead and wrap this up. I want to thank everybody for coming by. Of course, if you would like to get more of these shows, make sure to subscribe to this channel. And if you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts, make sure that you are subscribing to the Orrin McIntyre podcast uh, on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, guys, I'm happy to say that the podcast has now reached basically the same audience size as the show itself, which is pretty wild. Basically, the pod the audience has almost doubled in the like six or seven months uh, that the podcast has been a thing, along with the growth of the show itself. The, the, the uh, channel has also grown quite a bit. And that's amazing. So I really want to thank everybody. I, I appreciate the people who go on there. They subscribe. Uh, they, they leave the ratings or reviews. I know that sounds silly, but it really does help a lot with the algorithm. Uh, you know, and, and so I appreciate people are getting on there. The, the audience has really exploded uh, in this time. And uh, I have nobody to thank but you guys. So I really appreciate that. It's, again, it's so heartwarming. I, 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 yeah, just I'm, while I'm being thankful here, here, I'll say it one more time. I know guys who have been on here since I was just a JPEG and I had a, like a, like a hundred subscribers on the YouTube channel um, who are jumping on streams uh, with the blaze. Like while I'm commentating on a presidential uh, kind of a, a primaries and being like, that's our guy. Oh, great. We're so happy to see him. Blah. It's so great to see you in there. That means a lot to me. That means the world to me, knowing that people who have been there since the very beginning, who have supported me through all of this, through, through the buildup, uh, going, going, you know, alone, and then, you know, uh, joining the blaze to, to see you guys excited about that. Uh, I mean, of course, it's, it's very cool to have those opportunities, but, it, but it really is, um, I'm just very grateful, very, very thankful. Um, there, there's been a lot of hard work. You know, I put a lot of time in, uh, but but without you guys, it never would have even come close to having a chance. Uh, and it, it's just uh, incredible to watch a community come alongside you. Uh, so many people I've been friends with on Twitter and, and, and interacted with and, you know, on YouTube and and, and uh, Rumble and, and Gab and now kind of in real life with some of these Shieldings events, just having them cheer you on and everything, that, that's just an amazing thing. Uh, I can't, can't tell you enough how grateful I am. So I want to thank everybody for coming by, guys. And as always, I will talk to you next time.